hello. Hello to our live streaming audience on YouTube. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Um, and happy, happy Hispanic Heritage Month for those of you who are celebrating and those who are allies. Um, yes, uh, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, we do have um, some people who will be looking through the chat, and we'll get to those later today um, in, in the conversation. Also, um, although I will be moderating, moderating, I welcome our panelists to have a conversation with each other, ask each other questions. We want to open it up more like a discussion than, uh, than a moderating panel. Um, my name is Marley Rodriguez. I am, a, I am an LAFS uh, faculty member, but also the film program manager. I also run a production company with my sister called Cinemanas, blending sisterhood and cinema. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our guests today. First up is Alex, Alex Ferrufino. He is an acclaimed filmmaker and proud alumnus of the LA Film School. I'd also like to mention that he is a 2021 Spotlight Academy inductee. In 2019, his short film, Slipping Into Darkness, won the HBO Latino Film Festival, and it explores the struggles of a young Mexican-American named Juanito, drawing from Alex's own upbringing in Los Angeles. Inspired by a profound moment at the age of 16, Alex discovered his passion for visual storytelling, eventually graduating from our film program in 2010. Today, he continues to collaborate with fellow alum David Manzanales. Sorry. Yes, Manzanales. Okay, there we go. Aiming to illuminate the rich narratives within the Latino community through their unique projects. Please welcome Alex. Next up is Moisa Zamora. Ladies and gentlemen, Moisa Zamora is a visionary storyteller and creator, best known for creating the hit series, Selena, the series on Netflix. Moisa is a skilled writer and producer who masterfully brings cultural narratives to life on screen. With a talent for weaving compelling stories, he continues to captivate audiences with his creative prowess and dedication to showcasing diverse voices in the world of entertainment. His work also includes American Crime, Star, and Star Wars, The Bad Batch. Please welcome Moises. Thank you both for joining us today. No, thank you for having us. So we always like to start off with a positive vibe check. Just a, a quick little, before we jump in, let's get to some things that we're grateful for, some gratitudes, um, or something that is going on in your life that you feel really positive about. So, for example, I am very grateful to be moderating this panel. I'm also grateful that the writer's strike is over. <laughs> what about you guys? I'm grateful to share the stage with this man. <laughs> I'm grateful to share the stage with this visionary. Aww. <laughs> That's sweet. That's sweet. Anything else you want to no, share I mean that's, um, that's exciting in your lives? No, I mean, every day is exciting. Every day is a challenge. Every day you wake up, you know, inspired or motivated or even in the ups and downs, you, you have, you have the, the will to just keep on pushing, especially in this industry. You have to. Definitely. So, yeah, I'm grateful just to just be a filmmaker. Just keep going. Yeah, <laughs> just keep going. Absolutely. Um, I think you, for me, uh, just because it's just so soon, um, just reveling in the victory of the WGA strike being over and attaining an incredible deal, uh, more than what we asked for, uh, truthfully. And so I'm very grateful to be part of a union, to be in a, in, a, in a place where collective action actually takes on the biggest corporations of entertainment and we actually can come to an agreement. Uh, for the sake of protecting our careers as storytellers and for future generations. And I'm so grateful for that. It's such a relief. Now I'm a little PTSD from the five months, but um, being surrounded by people like Alex and other filmmakers and storytellers, it reminds me why I do the, you know, what I do and why storytelling, writing, creating is will always be my calling. And so just a reminder of that. And that's why I always love these kind of panels and talking to students at Los Angeles Film School. Very grateful to be invited here. Thank you, LA Film School. Uh, because it reminds me of my own journey of being a storyteller and continuing that work. Great, great. And if you could pick any actor to play you in your life, who would it be? <laughs> You know, that's a very tricky question because if I say a name, 
And then I get a phone call and be like, why didn't you say me? You know? <laughs> I think I'm going to go for an unknown, okay. for anonymous, a raw talent that can, you know, be Moises some more if it ever is made. But uh, just so I wouldn't offend any of my... <laughs> I, I'll say a name. I probably will offend people or not, but I really like um, Danny Ramirez. Um, actually, Steve. Steve knows my life really well, so if Steve is the lead for Slipping Into Darkness, I will lean on him too. But yeah, I, that's a good question. Two of the most handsome Latino actors <laughs> in entertainment, but okay, Alex, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> Danny Ramirez is probably one of the most talented people I've ever come across. Um, he is currently attached uh, to be the lead of one of my horrors. So uh, Ooh, very excited about working with him in the future. Hopefully, you know, I don't want to jinx it, but I uh, want that to, make to, to happen. And if you guys don't know who Danny Ramirez is, he is the new f um, Falcon in the Winter Soldier. He's the Latino <laughs> Winter uh, Falcon, so yeah. That's him. <laughs> He's also in um, Top Gun. He was the Latino pilot. Look at all the, oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, we know him. They're small roles in that sense. I mean, well, not the Falcon, but that in the Top Gun. But, you know, he's been working for a long time. And um, he actually auditioned for Selena uh, really? for the role of Chris. And he was so good. He gave me so many layers. Um, and I'm like, I need to work with that individual in the future. That's the exciting thing, too, about being a filmmaker. Sometimes someone's not a right fit for the role, but you bring them in, you, you have them uh, in mind for a potential future role, or you write them into something just because they like blow you away. Um, so continue on. Can you finish these sentences? I represent blank. I represent all the kids from the neighborhood. I represent a legacy of Latino struggle and immigrant voices and queer voices and just, you know, that little kid that wants to dream of something impossible. I'm here to say, hey, it's possible. Love that, love that. And then lastly, film changes the world by blank. I feel like I'm cheating because I've always like make up my answer when he's answering. Yeah. So now, <laughs> now um, I'm forced to give an answer <laughs> before. <laughs> um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Film changes the world by blank. Film changes the world by giving a voice to the voiceless. I've always thought that film um, changes the world for good or bad. Uh, because art can do that, you know, and sometimes art has been used in throughout history for the wrong reasons, and that could be, you know, we talk about propaganda during World War II. Um, but I do think it reminds us of our humanity, you know, and, and that's how it changes uh, people, to just remind them of their humanity, whether it's good or bad. And I think that's the power of art and storytelling. Great, great answer. Good questions. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> Not at all. I was quick. like, tell me your darkest secret. I'm more ready to tell to talk about that than like how well, <laughs> cinema affects the world. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll zoom out. <laughs> we'll we'll zoom out. And Moises, can you just tell us from your experience, like what uh, what has your journey been like from student to successful screenwriter and producer in Hollywood, and what were some of those pivotal moments? You know. Um, <sighs> On one hand, my story is like unlike other, but also very universal because it speaks about struggle and just like overcoming the impossible. And a lot of people of color or the, anybody that comes from a marginalized community can probably relate. But you know, I came to the States when I was 11 years old as an immigrant kid, I didn't speak English. Um, I still kind of know. <laughs> and so you had to figure out your identity, your place in this world. Um, it took me a little bit longer to figure out that I was a creator, a storyteller. Um, basically, when I got to college, um, I decided that I kind of, I made a declaration. And it was like towards the end of my senior year, like, I want to be a writer. Uh, I was slightly intoxicated. Um, everyone thought I was crazy. It was like, great, let's go to the concert. Um, but it really, 
um, you kind of have to make a declaration whether it is vocal like that or internal because it's not an easy career. It's not, it, you know, if you want to make money, go to real estate. If you want, you know, fame, like have a sex video. I don't know, you know, but it's, it's not an easy career. Um, and so to be a writer, to tell stories in whatever format, um, it's, it's a journey that doesn't have a, uh, like a pattern. It's not like you go to grad, I mean, you could, I guess you could go to grad school, but it's not like, you know, after you pass the bar, you can get a job, you know, it's like, there's no such thing. So you have to find your own journey. I actually started writing novels in Spanish first uh, because I thought, uh, immigrant kid, there's no Mexican-American novelist that I can look up to. You know, there was just not that representation. So I thought for me it was easier to just write in Spanish than actually, you know, take that leap. And then slowly, um, I started discovering entertainment and TV writing and screenwriting, mostly by being here in Los Angeles and being surrounded by other storytellers, and actually it was a student um, from USC, boo, uh, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> and that said like, hey, help me out produce this short film. And they're like, sure, okay, yeah, I can do that. Um, and I really fell in love with the process of producing a short film. And then enjoyed it so much that other people they got the word out, like got the word out with the USC students, and they all came to me. They're like, "Hey, can you produce mine and mine?" And I'm like, "No, no, 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 no. <laughs> I want I, I think I want to produce my own work. I think I want to go into this space." And went back to school. I went back to school because I love being a student. Um, it gets rid of my anxiety. It like if I feel like I'm insecure about writing, whether it's a, a specific format or comedy or whatever. I always take classes. I still take classes because you could always learn more. And there's, it, just, it feels tangible that you're doing something about the problem. So mm -hmm. I went back to school and I studied screenwriting and, and sort of kind of had my break there. Right. And I think like to piggyback on what he's saying, like you're in this business, you're always a student of the art. Every day you're learning. I mean, he, this man is creating a platform and every day this man is learning something. <laughs> so. It's just like studying, you know, studying the craft, studying the, the art, you know, especially if you're passionate for something, like you're always learning. You're always learning from your colleagues, from videos, whatever. There's always room to learn. So yeah, I, I w never stop studying. Well, I mean, there was this incredible book that I'm plug in, it's called The Talent Code. And it really makes the case for a biological way of developing talent. Uh, meaning you're not born with it. Obviously, you're born with intelligence and cognitive you know, skills, but it allows you to not really get kind of, you know, dissuaded from thinking that people are born a genius. No, you have to cultivate it. You have to keep working on your craft. It all sort of like compiles. And then before you know it, even your brain will be more skillful than you actually think so. You know, before you know it, you're already a really good storyteller. It all adds up, it's that muscle. You know, you gotta keep working that muscle. And um, you can't do it, but just like, you know, not allowing yourself to learn. So you're, you're starting out well, students. <laughs> yes. Yes, as technology too continues to disrupt the industry, my gosh, we always have to relearn new processes, re, uh, renegotiate contracts <laughs> and continue to, but a good story is a good story. Uh, you don't need technology to come up with a good story. You just need to be a reader, a consumer of stories, and put that to work. Yeah. And so for you, Alex, uh, what inspired you to become a filmmaker? Oh, man. I, um, so my journey is different. Uh, I grew up in the neighborhood. I grew up in South Central and rough parts of the valley. Um, but I was always an undercover nerd, you know, as much as I was game banging and doing all this stuff, I started in graffiti, so there was art, you know, comic books was the biggest thing, you know, comic books, skateboarding, all that stuff was part of my, my arsenal of art. So um, drawing, I started drawing um, at a young age and then getting closer to like graduating from high school, I, I skipped two years of high school and I was just doing art or I was just being a knucklehead, but I got a job um, doing a storyboard for a commercial for a director because he saw me drawing like on the sidewalk or I don't know, I remember where I was, but I was in the street just drawing and he's like, hey, do you, 
you want to do this for a living? You want to make some bucks? I'm like, yeah, sure. So, but I grew up, I also grew up in the back lot of Universal a lot. So seeing that made me just become even much a nerd and just be engulfing the, I mean, I saw the, what is it, the T-Rex um, uh, Soundstage 12. I saw the, 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 the where they had the T-Rex locked up. You know, that, that set in, in perspective, I'm like, oh shit, this is cool, you know, like this is dope, like I'm in this world. And then I saw the movie later on, a year later, I saw the movie and I'm like, oh, I know where that, where that was at. So it just made me like go into this world where like, yo, I could create a world and be in this whole world and be different and all that stuff. So that was early on. And then I think when my, when my homie passed away in front of me, that's really where I like, I had two choices to make either. I follow the path that most of them did or take this art scholarship and come to this film school. And that's what I did. So I did that. I started in the film industry first, then came to this school. So I was always the nosy kid. Every time I saw all these white trucks lined up in front of the high school that I used to go to in the summer, I used to just ask all the guys, all the Teamsters at the time, I didn't know what they were, but they're the ones that drive all the vehicles. So I'm like, hey, you guys need help? Hey, you guys need help? I'm 18, I could work, hey, hey. Yeah. And as much as I started bugging them and they kind of saw my familiar face, they're like, yeah, come on. So I started in the art department as a PA and then I was helping the grips and then from the grips I was just, pe I was peeing in all the departments and then I'm like, you know what, if I really want to take this seriously, I still had the scholarship on my hand. So I was all like, I can't go to AFI or none of these bigger, bigger schools, which we don't care about anyways. This is the film school's the best. <laughs> um, but um, but um, so I was like, you know, if I want to take this seriously and learn more of the vocabulary and the language, because I was on set, but I didn't know what they were talking about. So I was like, all right, let me take the most accelerated program they had at the time. It was 12 months in and out, and I was still working in the industry. And yeah, that was, the rest is history. From there, here I am, still working on it. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, just it, it's so lovely to hear when people work hard and that you see them get to the success that you're you're seeing now. So that's that's just a testament to hard work and and keeping keeping to it. And that and that just goes with everything. Like it, this, you know, I don't sugarcoat it. I tell you how it is. You know, I'm very straightforward. Like, you know, it's not easy. It's this business is not easy. But if you work hard and you make a name for yourself and you push hard and you're the you're, you're the student of the art, like you'll get to places. It's not it's not far fetched. Sooner or later, we will. It's just not the, the, the hard part is not giving up. Yeah, and, and as Moisa said, too, um, reputation. Like, you had a good reputation where everyone kept asking you to work on their projects. You know, one of the most important things, I'm sorry, like, my, when I talk too much, my throat goes dry. Um, <laughs> so we're good. We're doing good. Uh, one of the most important things in this town is definitely your, the word of mouth about who you are and how you relate to others. Um, we don't have second chances most of the time in this town. And so if somebody calls and be like, hey, you worked with Alex, how was he? And if people just say he was fantastic, hard worker, and so talented, people are gonna keep on calling. Um, you know, a lot of connections, jobs, opportunities um, come because somebody mentions your name at a meeting randomly in some you know, studio lot saying, I worked with Moises and he was great. In fact, one of the TV shows that I sold um, was because a couple of my writers from the Selena room, you know, sang my praises to some of the studio heads. And they're like, oh, then in that case, we want to work with him, you know? And they said, look, these, these people said these wonderful things about you. Let's make a show, you know? So it's, it, that is important, you know, um, to be able to show up, um, work hard, do your 100% if you can. Obviously, there's a lot of exceptions there, you know, because like life is hard, but, and, uh, and people will, c will call. And so you two have a sort of relationship, mentee, mentor, can you talk yeah, a little bit about it's, that? Yeah, it's very unique and, and it's, it's becoming awesome, to be honest. <laughs> and we're still, our relationship just keeps on growing. But so when i when we submit the, fe uh, the film, Slipping Into Darkness to Festivals, it did a circuit run, it did a lot, of, it got a lot of rejections, it got a lot of, bad publicity, I guess, if you want to call it, but to me it's good. Um, and then 
you know, one of the festivals accepted us, and then we took the HBO win. Um, we're the first HBO Latino short film competition to win, and we took best short of the overall festival. And that was, that will catapult to put us on HBO, and then once it got onto HBO, it aired, the minute it aired, the pandemic hit. And I got representation, but you know, we were trying to figure out how we're gonna navigate, so general meetings and all this stuff was all Zoom, and so my manager introduced me to him um, because of the short, and I had a, I, we, me and David, created the, the series behind it. And so we had a general meeting and he loved the short right then and there. He, he loved it, he expressed how he felt about it and then he gave me notes about the series and all this stuff. We didn't work on that specifically, but there's one thing that I took from that was uh, this, this guy's dope and I want him to be a mentor because he, he what well, we call in the neighborhood, he peep game. You know, he dropped some gems and one thing he dropped that it, out of my general meetings that I've been having, I was like, well, this guy really took his time to express certain things. And he said, you know what? I'm gonna give you some advice, bro. Uh, make sure your, your your grammar's on point. Make sure your P's or Q's are this, this, and this, and the other. And I'm like, oh, this, my, this man is schooling me. <laughs> because, but no, but there's a reason why, because, you know, as our last names, Samora, um, Ferrofino, well, Amunos Ferrofino. You know, when they see that in the email or they see the title page, off the bat, they're criticizing your grammar. Off the bat, they're gonna be like, dismiss it because bad English. And he taught me that. And then since then, I'm like, I told my manager, I like him. I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but we're gonna be, he's gonna be my mentor in a way. He just doesn't know it yet. That's what I said. So. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> don't, don't get it twisted. <laughs> well, and give me that one. Give me that one. <laughs> but no, so he was working on, I think you were still wrapping up Selena at the time. And I think you were still in post or you were doing, oh, you were shooting the second part. And um, so he was busy and he was getting traction with Selena. And obviously, you know, I wanted to, I told my manager, I wanted to fire a showrunner that's Latino, that knows the culture, does, you know, I didn't want it to just give it up or take it to somebody that doesn't know the culture because it's very niche and it's very subculture. So, but it did it, it, that's fine. You know, things happen for a reason. Um, years have passed. And then it was just, we always kept in touch. And then I don't, he, the platform, I think the platform really what got us back into conversation because we were always, hey, what's up, what's up? And then he started cooking up a platform, not knowing that he was. And then, you know, he reached out and we talked about the platform and that's where we at. And we've been, since then it's been to just go, go, go. Like, let's get this going. And I really admire this guy. Well, um, one of the things that I make it um, sort of part of my career, part of my everyday is being able to make myself available for emerging voices, for writers, creators, uh, that especially that come from a similar background that I come from. Because it kind of sort of, kind of paint it forward. I mean, I, you know, I, I love to tell this story and I'm sure my mentor loves, it, you know, loves me to tell that story because like, um, you know, when my first break, which was my first TV writing job was for American Crime and American Crime was a show created and show ran by John Ridley uh, and it was a Regina King show, um, won all the Emmys. Uh, that was my first gig, but I wouldn't have gotten that gig because um, you can be prepared, you can be an excellent writer, but you still need that door to open. You need someone to be like, hey, welcome, here it is. Um, walk in, take that meeting. And that for me was uh, David Perez. And David Perez was a writer on American Crime, one of the Latino writers there. And you know, like a panel like this, I went up to him and be like, hey, you look like me, you sound like me, you have a similar background. Um, can I take you out for coffee and so I can learn from you so I can see if perhaps I can mimic your pathway into getting into a TV writer's room? And he's like, no. Um, I don't have the time. I can't go out to coffees for everyone that comes up, but you can be my Facebook friend. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, all right, I see you. Okay, I, I, I can respect that. Um, and obviously, 
you know, Zoom is, Zooms are good, yeah, but like no, nobody has time to go to the coffee shop anymore, you know, or ever. I, I, but, um, but then he like put, posted a class uh, about writing and preparing for the fellowships, the TV writing fellowships. And I'm like, I'm gonna take his class, you know? Um, and I took his class with the purpose of getting to know him, to learn from him. And I, of course, like I said, I love taking classes. And because of that, particular relationship and he was stuck with me for 10 weeks like he had to get to know me <laughs> I was a student um, and so he learned my about my writing and my background he's like yo like your script is great like I'm gonna send it to some people that I know can you send it to me you know it was like on a Thursday can you send me that and maybe you're like your bio and you know just so I had everything ready because um, I, I was applying for that fellowship and it was, I think I got a call on a Tuesday um, from one of the executives of American Crime. We're like, we love your sample. Davey submitted it. Would you like to consider you know, coming in for an interview for a staff writing job? And I was like, um, yes. Um, and then interviewed, interviewed with everybody, got my first TV writing job without an agent. So, And that is difficult to do, guys. That, that, that that's awesome. a miracle. But if it weren't for Davey, like sending the material, but also knowing and recognizing that I was ready, because that's important, you gotta be ready, because those opportunities will show up. They will show up, and you have to be very smart about when to take them and how to proceed with them. You need to be ready. And part of it had to do with the small thing of like making sure that there were no typos on that, you know, on that script. And if you're nervous about it because you're so deep into writing something and whatever, pay somebody, invest, and get a proofreader. And that's what I do. Get, a, get somebody that is like a grammar nerd. By the way, I, I was not an undercover nerd. I was a, a for real nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be undercover now, you know, with my like it's fashion. Cool. <laughs> but not anymore. Uh, and and that's, that, that's part of the process. That's part of your process. Know thyself. You know, know what you, what you're good at, what you're not good at. If you like always making typos on things, get somebody to look at after them. It doesn't mean you're a better or worse writer. It just means that you're, just you know, making sure that your script is clean. And then when people see it, they're like, oh shit, this is professional. Format. Learn the format. Don't get creative. It's been used for a hundred years. Would you think you're gonna come up with a new format that's gonna be revolutionary? No. Play by the rules because they want to focus on the story. They want to focus and see if you can deliver that story. So format, no typos. How else do you know you're ready? A lot of it is also maturity. Um, like, just like any job. This is one of the weird jobs where you actually have to talk about your trauma at the, at the interview process. Um, yes. So you can get the job. Um, and it's like, you know, in any other industry, that's kind of bananas, right? Like, well, let me tell you by the time when, like, I almost died, you know? Or I come from a broken home. Or I saw my friend die in front of me. Yeah. Um, that's the kind of stuff that you have to talk about. Your own experiences and how you relate uh, to those experiences and how you express them through your writing. You may have had something very real like that, but you might be a like a horror or science fiction writer, so you have to connect the dots. So when you're able to express about your process, your writing, your experiences, and how, you know, and without falling like you know to pieces and crying because <laughs> they're not your therapist, um, and being able to be like, and that's how I put that into my writing, and that's how I'm going to be a great writer for you, you know, whether it's for TV or for studio head that is looking into buying your, your feature or when you're collaborating with a director. It's like, what are you bringing to the table? Because this is the thing, there are a lot of fantastic writers on the page. So you have to be stellar on the page. And then on top of it, you also have to be stellar as a person when they meet you. And for those introverts, practice. <laughs> You know, cheat somehow because I, I've, I've encountered incredible writers on the page and they're, ch you know, this is the thing about artists. They come in all like, you know, personalities and as soon as like they go into the interview, they're like, they want to die. You know, <laughs> I had one of those writers for Selena be like that and I could, she bombed the interview, bombed. 
but like her experience and her writing sample, and I'm like, she's fantastic. And, I, and she still got the job, and I'm not going to her wedding, she's getting married. Um, but all that to say is, you know, being a writer is not just getting it done on the, on the page, it's you have to be this entrepreneur, this personality, it's a lot better for the extroverts. Uh, but um, it is important to be able to speak about your craft. No, I was just, what, what he was saying, like, you know, I'm not the best writer, and I know I own up to it. I, I, I love telling stories, and I love putting stuff on paper, Or, but, you know, I got partners like David and John in the back that we collab and write together, but, like, when he gave me that advice that his mentor gave him the advice, I took it and ran with it, and I get somebody to proofread it all the time, especially when it's going to go out. And so it's just us three back and forth, or just being creative. But once I know, like, okay, this is solid to go out, and then I proofread. And another thing that I do um, is I'm represented. I have I had a manager now. I don't now. I just have agents. But when I share a, uh, a piece of material, like a script with my agents or anybody that is in the professional sort of ecosystem of Hollywood. That script is, I usually do my own development process, I vet it. I also pay for people to give me notes, professional notes that I trust, like coverage. Coverage, yes. Yeah, screenplay mechanic, they all do it, studios do it, everyone does it. It's like a two page, basically evaluation of your script. Um, so you wanna use those services to give you an idea of like where you're at. You know, like what do you need to switch? What are the things that you need to fix? So I kind of go through my own development process before I even share a draft with anyone in my profession. My managers, my, my, my agents, they don't get like that first or second draft. They get like the sixth draft. And they still have notes. Don't get me wrong. They're, everybody still has notes. They never end. But, um, <laughs> but at least you're starting from a really good place, like a very solid script. To, for it to be great. And everybody's gonna have a different perspective on how to fix things or what to recommend. But that becomes more objective as opposed to like, is this solidly written and does it have a premise? Does it have characters? Am I missing something? Um, and at that point, you're in better shape. You're a professional writer. And so we've talked a lot about writing and I'm curious to hear from your perspectives, your experiences producing or on the other side in production. How do you balance show running and the creative aspects and like logistical and same for you and and what experiences have you had that have been memorable in the productions you've you've been on uh, well this is the thing uh, you know in television um it's uh, different it's different writer rules um and now for sure after this agreement uh this strike uh never it's caught the showrunner now for the first time is codified into the language of our contract meaning the writer is the head writer, showrunner, hiring, and also has production uh, responsibilities. And they hire the various directors to basically carry out their vision. And features is different. It's different, so the writers, I say, I say it in these terms, the writers have the power in TV. They're the ones that know the story from beginning to end. Directors come in and go. They're leaf frogs sometimes because one is one pr one episode's in production, one episode's in post, one is in pre, one's in post. So that's why directors leapfrog. It's rare. It's now is becoming a thing where there's a director for the whole series, and I think that's more in Disney platforms, especially for these Star Wars and all that stuff. But yeah, that 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 formula is different. And the other side is the direct, and the feature side is the director, show running the whole show, making sure the visuals are the. Because usually they probably are the writer and director if, if you're not collaborating. So it's a little different. I, I've i never been in the TV space besides like the reality space, competition, um, and um, not scripted so much here and there, but not, n not heavy. I've been in the independent feature and more on the competition reality stuff and all that stuff. So, so I've never experienced to his level the writer's room um, working with execs in that level yet. I want to, and I will one day. But as far as the feature, I think for me it's collaboration. And I think because I've done all the departments, it's easier for me to conversate with everybody. It's easy because I think one of the jobs as a director or as a showrunner is how to deal with people, the dynamics of people. How, 
how are you going to convey how are you going to convey this to them and make them believe that this is what you want you know it's it's a, and it's a fun process but it's dealing with people is the number one job for me and then the craft and the that comes all second nature for me but i love being on set but I, my favorite part is post production really? to me <coughs> yeah to me that's the third rewrite so I, I, I love all, the, each stage is a rewrite, but I mean the third rewrite comes in post because something that you thought was gonna work on paper doesn't work <coughs> in the scene. And I think, I, I don't, I can't speak, but like when he's writing a TV show, I'm, a, I'm assuming that he's on set and like, <coughs> this is not working. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you do that, the actors will kill you. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of conversations that lead up to that. Um, and that's important, and I think you, you really nailed it in when he said it's about talking to people. So either way, whether you're in charge of a feature or you're in charge of a TV show, there are leadership positions. You are responsible. And in TV, a showrunner has to carry out the vision, has to convey that not only to a group of writers in, in, in their room, but also to all the department heads and execs. And like you're constantly selling the show and the vision all the time. And you have to make decisions. Um, I think. You know, I was lucky enough to be part of the showrunners training program that the WGA has, and it was like a six weekends um, type of boot camp. And you know, we got all the showrunners to come in and talk about the different, you know, varying stages of showrunning. And John Wells, as you know, it's like you know a legend in TV. He was wonderful in the sense of like, I know that creative people don't like budgets, but they're your best friend because you gotta know the budget inside out. And you know, I see an Excel sheet and a chest. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wanna do no numbers. No, <laughs> but you really gotta understand and be able to speak up on it because a lot of the decisions creatively that you have to make boil down to that budget. And John Wills was like, know your budget because the executives might forget that you bombed, you know, a show or or it didn't do well, um, but you'll never forget that you went over budget. <laughs> no, seriously, it's that's like a serious. That's a serious talk. Like, like as a director, making your day, y'all better know how to make your day or mm -hmm. figure out how to make your day because that will reflect the budget. You know what I mean? So. The understanding the budget as much as I, I, I don't like money talk. I really don't. I, I hate negotiating. And in, in, in the independent feature, you have to wear multiple hats. So I have to negotiate with my team. Um, what number this? What number that? What's going to cost? But yeah, like he's right. The, the margins as far as like he did that show, it wasn't good. But hey, he was, he was under budget or he was on budget. And that's what they have the power. Yeah, and, and, and it's important because a lot of times, um, you know, when we're writing our scripts and our stories, we're not thinking budget, you know, we're not thinking product. And you shouldn't at this point. You should really just have the freedom to write whatever you want. But once you're on set and you have, you know, maybe that helicopter scene is out, you know, and you have to figure out a way that it's creatively um, compatible with your story that sort of delivers that what you wanted to deliver. Maybe you won't get the helicopter, but you get something else just as powerful that really represents what you really wanted to accomplish. And that's just like a good problem to have. Um, and I can't wait for you guys all to go through it. <laughs> <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> the torture. I immediately <laughs> think about my frugal immigrant family and hitting me on the head and being like, save, save, save. So every time I'm in production too, it's like this little voice in my head that's like my grandparents being like, we came to America and save. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so you, you mentioned a little bit about Video Mart, but could you tell us more about that project and how that came about and what you're doing with it now? It's gonna be a pretty dope platform for sure. That's all I could say. Uh, well, this is one of the things that I kind of, either whether it's a good quality or a bad quality of mine, is I just can't sit, stand still when things are happening around me that I could partake and change. Um, one of the things that I discovered, and this is the reason why we have two labor strikes, 
or we had two lever strikes in one up, second one about to be resolved, hopefully, is that the streaming model really is broken as far as like compensation for independent filmmaking, TV. Just to give you an example of numbers, here we go with numbers and data. Um, I created Selena. I was part of the. I'm an executive producer. And, you know, ran the room. Selena was watched by 25 million households the first four weeks of its release. With those kind of numbers, and that's just like, you know, and I only know that because Netflix was so proud of those numbers, they published an article about it. But with those numbers and then broadcast model and a cable model, I would be up in the hills in my mansion and be like, yeah, Selena, you know? Um, it's true, it's true. Those numbers in cable, <laughs> unbelievable, right? So. And so here I am, like, excited that I have a global hit. And it was number one in Latin America forever. And Mexico is like, you know, four weeks. And even in Iceland, it actually was great. So it's like, that was the power of Netflix. But it doesn't translate into securing a career for me. And it didn't translate into a little bit of pocket change, you know, uh, for me to continue working on my shows. Yes, have I sold shows after that because of it? Yes. Have I put, you know, I'm working on development? Yes. But it, it's not a guarantee that like things are gonna go up. So it's like, I was kind of just like so confused. It's like, that was a global hit. I mean, how many global hits do they want? You know, like I, we kind of did the impossible with even a lot of challenges, like our, our show was not your typical budget. It was a hybrid of an international budget and you know American budget. So we even did it under budget and it still was not enough to prove my worth and to be able to have that career. So it's just like, uh, there's gotta be a better way. There's gotta, I mean, obviously this is way before the strikes were coming our way because it was like, a, you know, literally an epidemic of abuses when it came to the streaming models. So I started talking to tech people. I started talking to venture capitalists and they were like, you know what? We love entertainment. A story tell, you know, movies and TV will always be there, but the like but you're right, the model is broken. We can't make money off of it. Come up with a new model. Venture out into different kind of ways of technology. And so just into looking into technology and ways to benefit the creator, benefit the users, have a different kind of window, a different little a stream, different type of different uh, platform that benefits both the, f the, the user and the filmmaker, ha almost directly with no middleman. And we went into sort of the blockchain uh, technology because one of the things that fascinated me about blockchain, and this is like what cryptocurrencies is NFTs sort of are based on, is you take a digital asset and it tracks ownership. So like, and that's all I cared about. Like that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you could take a digital asset, like a movie, buy it, enjoy it, add things to it, and if I want to sell it to another user in a platform, I think that's game changing. That, that little, that action creates a partnership with the user, with the fan, with people, with the filmmaker that has never existed before. So, we started venturing into that and realizing, well, what do we need? We need the platform, we need the structure to create that, like that kind of marketplace where you buy a digital movie, love it and enjoy it, and then sell it if you want to. And so I teamed up with the, uh, a software uh, engineer who had created essentially this platform, but he was doing it for NFTs. And we're like, no, I don't want NFTs, I want digital movies that I can sell and buy using just the technology underneath. I don't even want, we don't even want to be tied to cryptocurrencies. We just want to be able to buy and sell movies. He's like, we can do that. So then the other thing was another uh, digital component was the digital wallet. So it's like how to track that without, you know, knowing technology. So we teamed up with this other software engineer and he had a digital wallet where you can just sign up with an email. So now, now we have a platform. So I was like, well, now I gotta get myself some films. So the first thing I thought, let's bank on diversity. Let's bank on young, 
you know, like diverse, like fast adopters that love technology that won't blink twice because we live in a creator economy. Like we're in the TikTok world. People are monetizing their content. Um, it's not the same. Like nobody wants to subscribe to 10 platforms anymore. They want to be paid to enjoy entertainment. So that's when, I <laughs> that's when I thought of like, well, if we can get the filmmakers that are like emerging voices, provide a space for them and bring in their communities onto the platform, then there's something there for emerging filmmakers, for that talent in those films that we'd ever see, they get buried if they ever make it to Netflix. So that's why I thought of Alex. And I'm like, I remembered his short film. I really loved it. And I knew that he was legit in the sense that like, this is a person that's gonna continue working in this space, is gonna be continue creating incredible work. And it represents a specific community that I wanna support. And also they're good people. And you wanna work with good people. And so he's like, yo, this is what I got. Why don't we put up Sleeping Into Darkness into Video Mart and reach out to our audiences and create, um, you know, sort of the newest sort of platform out there for filmmakers. And that's really exciting because with this platform, you're able to do even more things. For example, one of the things that we're excited about, and this is, you know, going to be helpful once we share this information with everyone in LA Film School, is any user. Um, has the ability of affiliate marketing. So it's like they can use their unique link, share that unique link, and promote Video Mart on their socials. And any new user that signs up through that link, through that link, you get 20% of all their purchases. So you become part of the business side of it. So then what we're doing is we're sharing the profit with you guys. We don't have marketing budgets to meet Netflix you know, at that level. We, but we have people. We have people that are hungry, that they want to see their stories, that have been neglected by the entertainment community, and that really just want a place where they can find their film and own it, you know? And so that's what we're doing. And we're launching, um, right now we have over 100 films. Uh, most of them are features. A lot of them also are shorts, including Sleeping Into Darkness and we're negotiating another 300. Fantastic. And um, our official launch, hopefully, you know, uh, um, will be at Sundance uh, this coming year. So Video Mart, it's the only platform where you can buy and sell movies. And um, it's a new way of enjoying your entertainment. That sounds fantastic and empowering emerging filmmakers, which definitely get lost and abused in the shuffle there. Yeah, and especially in the short format space, because yes. I mean, to this day, short formats, you know, they're, they're big expensive calling cards or, you know, they're passion projects and you, you wanna do the feature version of it, but you can't, so you do these short films. So yeah, we got onto HBO, it did its traction, but then once it got off HBO, like what else, you know? And we do have a series for it, but you know, that, that content that me, David, and John created, you know, it was just sitting there in a hard drive. So the fact that, you know, it makes sense because there's other platforms that are coming out that wanted the film, but for me and David and John, that make, this makes sense because, you know, we, we don't have monies in our pocket, you know, we were in debt from these shorts because we put all our money, our assets, and all that stuff. So it's like, all right, we could make a buck, but we could also use our audience because our audience is loyal, and we d and we understand that we have an audience for those films. So we're like, all right, let's do this, and that made sense to us, and that's why it's going on video mart. One of the things that was very important for me is, and also because I'm selfish as hell uh, when it comes to my storytelling, is like I wanted to have a space where filmmakers could basically come and be like, yo, can I distribute my film? I mean, obviously we're curating the content to some degree, um, but, because um, we're not a TikTok, you know? But at the end of the day, I also wanna at least have a space where if I have a feature or short. Yeah, that's, that's one of the goals. It could be, a, it could have an audience. You know, like, and this is a person that has already had millions of millions of people watch their show, right? Like, I already have, I already had millions of people watch their show. And so, where am I? Like, still looking for that connection. 
and I'd rather build a whole platform <laughs> and get into tech instead of writing stories. Well, I'm still writing stories because I'm insane. But in order for me to have a space, you know, maybe I don't, it's kind of hard for me to, and abstractly to sort of measure like the millions and millions of people that watch my show because I don't have a connection with those people. I don't know who they are and Netflix will never tell me. At some point, I think, like in a panel, like this Friday Film Festival, um, we were talking with some of the actors for Selena when it was still kind of going, and like, like 850 little girls from the ages of 12 and 13 showed up from all over Latin America to that Zoom, and like the panel was in English. They like so 90% of them probably didn't understand what we were saying, but they were just so happy to be there supporting. And I'm like, oh. That's my audience. I mean, like we kind of knew that it would like target obviously young little Latinas because <laughs> Selena, but that's the power of Selena. But it's just like I wish I had a little bit more context to be able to cultivate those audiences and that demographic and that fan base because they grow up. Now they're not 12 and 13. Now they're 16, 17. That's a different kind of you know show that they're watching. Um, and the, you, you almost want to grow with your audience. Yeah, because that's, that was our experience for HBO. Like, we never got the numbers how it did on HBO, and we always were curious. But we did, we do have a Slipping Into Darkness um, page, like an Instagram page. And even the 3,000 or 4,000 followers we have there, they were loyal and they wanted more. And they, and you know what's funny? The, the audience that we had were more female based, even though it's a very male dominant show. But it's because we had store, we had DMs about that's my son, that's my husband, that's my father. I've lived this, you know. So and you know, I went to jail when my dad went to jail. You know, like so that 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 type of engagement is intriguing for us because we know we could, you know, we could work that. The word of mouth is powerful, so I I really love the platform for that. One of those reasons why we're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And one of the things that to piggyback on that, that was very important to create a platform that has that access to your fan base. Like you'll, because this blockchain is very transparent, so you know exactly who's buying your stuff. Like, I mean, you'll see their usernames, but you'll see who is interacting with you. You'll be able to have, you know, live streaming to the people that hold um, your title. You'll be able to send them stuff. You'll be able to have that connection. And you, of course you can do that over social media and Instagram, but this is a particularly um, catered to filmmakers and their audience. And, and I think that's, you know, I think it's at the crux of what storytelling is. I mean, it not only defines our humanity, but we need to connect with each other. Like the scrolling thing doesn't work anymore, you know? Um, it's more about how do I relate to the story he's telling um, and being able to have that conversation. Yeah. I like I don't like the algorithm that Netflix or these platforms have when you watch something and tells you oh this is what you want to watch or this is the recommendation that you want to watch no like I have a niche I like certain stuff I want to watch those certain stuff or find other stuff that's related to but that's the that's one of the platforms that it, the the ability to just know who's engaging or who's buying your stuff and who's watching it that's dope that's super dope because now you could cater to that audience and you could give those those films that they're seeking for. And on top of that, we know that we're in a word of mouth world, when you have so much content, you're gonna believe your friend or someone that has like a taste that you trust. So that's why we're monetizing. That's why we're giving that twenty percent of that purchase price. You know, like we're we rather give that space so we can create a community that feels a little bit more honest than the algorithm. And a lot of times the algorithm is just basically advertising. They're gonna put the most expensive shows they made on that algorithm. It's like, um, do I really need to see Emily in Paris again? You know, like, come on, let's go, you know? Um, but and that's basically how that is. And then another thing, uh, another thing too, the fact that um, as a filmmaker, we could make money, you know, because sometimes we don't even see money, you know? depending on the contract, depending on the deal, depending if it did good, you know, depending if it did bad, it, those all factor, but like if there's money to be made and we could make another one, because the goal is to get that money and make another one. You know, that's the goal, because at this point you're distributing, you're self-funding your own projects and you're distributing your own projects in this platform. That's really what that platform is gonna be. That, and I think that's a cool way of spending it, where 
these upcoming dope filmmakers with different voices, different backgrounds, dropping these these jams on here and you could watch them and then you could sell them or do whatever you want with them. And I think that's different and cool. Well, I think a lot of, I mean, we've heard, if you're not familiar with Hollywood creative accounting is like, you know, they're supposed to be profit sharing and back end and all these things that they're promised in a deal when you make a deal to make a movie or a TV show, but because they spent it all on marketing and, you know, I don't think like any film has made any money, you know, in the past like 25, 30, 40 years because they always go on the red so they don't pay that back end in profit sharing. So somewhere those billion dollar movies are getting, you know, that profits are not, they're not ending up with the, the filmmaker and that was also, a big deal for a lot of feature filmmakers, for example, is like I remember going into the WGA meetings where like, you know, writers were like, um, you know, I wrote a feature, a horror, it was $7 million, it made $120 million. Uh, they told me that like, it didn't make any profits, but they want me to make a second one. Um, so it's like, that's the catch 22 there, right? So. With us, we're like, well, from coming from a standpoint of I'm a creator first, and then I'm a tech giant. Well, we will be, we're, we're, we're tech giant, little giants. Uh, <laughs> but like, you know, I didn't want that. <laughs> you know, so if there's going to be marketing, we're integrating it into the price point, and that's it. That's why that 20% is there, because then everything else is free up for the filmmaker and the distribution platform, and it's clear as day, and you know exactly what are you gonna get, and you know exactly how many people bought it, and that's it, end of story. I, I think it's great because you're not gatekeeping the information, right? So you're like yeah. democratizing the data so that the filmmakers can get directly in touch with their audiences, and they're empowering them financially too, so that's, it's a lot, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, we are taking a model, um, com you know, day and night compared to the streaming platforms, day and night, like, let's, let's share the data, I don't care. You know, why not? In fact, like, why don't we use that to our advantage in the sense of like, everybody knows who is on the platform. Fantastic, let's celebrate Absolutely. that. You know, and if there are not too many people are in that platform or not too many people bought your film, then let's find out why. Or cultivate and co like, you know, um, th that loyal fan. See, if you only have 100 people that bought your film, those are the most 100 people in the planet as a filmmaker for you. And 100, like, will recommend it to another two, three, and then you grow from there. But at least you know where to start. You know, knowing is half the battle, and then the rest, it's just work. And we're already doing the work. So let's just be a little bit more clear-eyed where we're going. And I think that that's foundational to any filmmaker and to be able to sustain their career. Fantastic. Great. Do we have any time for questions? Are we still good on questions? OK. OK. OK, great. Do we have any that came in the chat? Oh no. <laughs> it's out. <laughs> it's out. So we f we finally got greenlit for our first feature. Um, Congratulations. And that's yeah. <laughs> and that's what they're talking about. Um we are not we're not ready to set out uh, send out the breakdown and we'll just follow the four ways Instagram or one of our Instagrams and you will see when we announce um open casting calls for the Bay Area. Awesome, great, great. Any audience questions here before I go back? Yeah. Well, Selena is like our Beyonce. She's the queen. <laughs> and I love Selena. But um, as, as far as me, I mean, I had a mentor. I have, I have a lot of mentors. I love mentors, guys. But there was one mentor that told me and David, write what you know. Write what you know and ride that wave, and then you could venture and do your Lord of the Rings or your whatever sci-fi, but 
you have a voice, you have people that look up to you, and you have a lot of stories with that specific scenario. Yeah. Just write what you know. And that's really what the four ways guys and I we work on is just giving the giving a different perspective, you know. We we tend to complain that why are they telling our stories but because we're not telling their damn selves. So that's that's really what we're we're that's the the catapult to four ways and when we started back in 2016 is just write what we know. And also that can be translated into a lot of things, right? If you if you know an absent father and your struggles with that relationship, that's Star Wars, <laughs> you know? True. Um, and so it's just a matter how you want to paint the picture. Um, but it is the, the, the outline of, of what he's talking about. Um, for Selena, it was a little interesting because Selena w came to me um, through my agents, by, with my producers, because uh, through the producers that they, uh, part of the agency, um, they, um, I, was I was actually pitching a different show around town. I had acquired the rights to this 13-year-old um, Mexican girl who is considered a genius. Like, she speaks five languages. Um, she graduated from college. She has, like, she's the youngest psychologist in the world. And so I was going to do, like, a Mexican Dewey Hauser. And that led to people were like, that's cool. We don't want that. But we have something else, you know? And then they called me, like, okay, would you be up for, and this was, like, a week before meaning the producers that had the rights to, to tell the story of Selena. And I'm like, okay, well, Selena Gomez, not my generation, but I can make it work. <laughs> I can make it work. They're like, no, Selena Quintanilla, like See 90s. I, I was like, what? what? Um, <laughs> and like, I grew up with Selena, like quinceañeras, wedding. She was like, I, like my aunts went to her shows. You know, I, I was too little to go, of course, but like they went, like they saw her live. So, um, I was like, anything for Selena. I mean, it's like, at first I was like, wait, like, why are they bringing this to me? I'm like, I've only had two shows under my belt. And the truth was they were looking for a Latino, Latino writer, and they still hadn't found that story, that voice, that tone, that approach. And, um, and they were thinking of more than six episodes. And, and I'm like, Okay, well, I knew a lot about Selena already growing up. You know, I, I felt like, in fact, like Selena was, when she died, um, I realized a little bit about my, my identity. Um, in a way, she allowed me to be Mexican and American. Um, because at first, my worlds were so compartmentalized. You know, my Mexican upbringing, Spanish, like all these Selena things, you know, cumbia, whatever. And it was so separate from my American world, English, you know, studying education, like all these other things that were kind of never kind of merged. But then Selena passed away and it was, you know, and the world knew about her. And it really was in school when Dreaming of You was playing. And then my like white friends in school were loving it. And I was like, no, she's ours, you know? <laughs> Not cool, you know. Like we knew, like I was like getting different. Like I knew her. You just like, it. but in in a moment, it made me realize that like, oh, oh, she was both. She is both, and I can be too, you know. And to be Mexican and American, and so, and that is an identity of its own, and that's whole. It allowed me not to feel in the middle. It allowed me not to feel half, like, a half identity, you know? It allowed me to be whole. It's like to be Mexican-American is an American. You know, it's, it's, we've, we've always been here since the inception of this country. So we're part of that fabric. And it made me really proud of that. And so, of course, I wanted to write this show. And of course, I, I told this to the producers, you know? And, and additionally, I wanted the Mexican and American identity to be the American dream, or our version of the American dream. And so the tone, the entire sort of vision for the show was always was gonna be aspirational. It was always gonna be a family-like, 
you know, uh, American dream story, like hard work. Because I also related to that. I cleaned houses with my mother in high school. I cleaned the houses of my own classmates when I was in high school because I knew the value of hard work. And so they, and they also did hard work too, you know? Like they were like, you know, freezing their asses off in a bus that was like half broken, trying to like go to the next gig because somebody believed in the dream as their parents, as a family, they did it together. So I wanted to, encamp- not, you know, of course there was the tragedy, but that was really the essence of the show. And so when I pitched that to the producers, when I pitched that to the family, we got a two season order from Netflix. You got the job. Job. Yeah. Plus more. <laughs> yeah, plus plus more. the next season. Yeah. No, no, they, no, they, which is, this never happens, by the way. They greenlit, they did greenlit two seasons. It was straight to series, but two seasons. Um, great. And we're like, great, let's go. Okay. Any other questions? Online, we're good. Anyone in here? Yes, you know, one of the things that, you know, when you have subscription platforms, you you subscribe, right? And there's like endless content. And there's no real, I mean, there's a level of curation and there's a level of targeting, sure. But I feel like there are opportunities missed. And each film is a world. So it's like, think of it more like when you buy a film with us, you're buying a ticket to that filmmaker's like world or that you know, vision. We want to be able to sort of provide not only that void that that DVDs used to have for people. Blockbuster. Yeah, like, you know, Video Mart has like a 90s feel to it. You know, if you go to videomart.club, you'll see like the colors are a little 90s and, you know, we even took some like, you know, colors from literal VHS tapes, you know, that sort of, because we want to be able to provide that weird experience of physical experience of going through the roles and discovering like stories Um, and filmmakers. That's how I discovered like my favorite filmmakers just randomly at a video store in college. It was called Acme Video. You know, random, like Agnieszka Holland, if you know that filmmaker, that's how I discovered Agnieszka Holland, one of my favorite filmmakers. So, to me, I wanted to provide that. So when you're buying a ticket, you're not only buying a ticket to watch the video, but you're buying the ticket to like Alexis Ferrofinos' process and behind the scenes and other things that he may provide for it. And that and, and that's also one of the other things that, uh, that is a good question because that's cool because you could set a price point depending on packages. Like you could just buy the movie itself and watch the movie for three ninety nine, right? But then you could sell your your other portion of it at seven ninety nine or eight ninety nine and have more of that experience where you get um, not just even like behind the scenes, but you could even get like a meet and greet with the the actors. Like it gets more in depth. It'll get more in depth as far as like you're really in the experience of the filmmaker, of the artist, of the story. You know, you could get digital copies of sign um, headshots, whatever it is that you as a filmmaker want to present to this platform, to your audience, that option's available. For example, we have a film that it's kind of a magical horror um, and the filmmaker actually wrote a novella after he created the film. So that's going to be provided as an ebook within the same title. You know, so like there's a lot of things that you could do that just expand instead of just like the one, you know, scrolling, click, watch, I'm done, you know. So to me that it, it sort of creates that that 
that access to to your media. And and if you don't want it, or if you're done with it, and you want to resell it to a third user, sell it. And you could bring, and it's almost like the high piece era, right? When the the, the exclusivity of a shoe. You can mark up a price where, like, you know, this is so dope. I want to sell it for 10, even though I got it for four. You know what I mean? So you start becoming this, your own, you become a business partner without dealing with all the negotiation. Right. No, I mean, one of the things that I really like about even that idea is we live in a world where, like, there's endless supply of content, endless supply of one type. And I think that squanders demand. I mean, that's basic economics, right? Like when you have endless supply of one thing, demand is going to be like, mm. you know, that's why like so marketing goes into things. But if you say like, if you only have 10,000 copies of Sleeping Into Darkness and they come with all these things, that's just it. That's all you need, you know? And at, you know, 699, 10,000 copies, that's 69,000 for a short film. It's a hurdle. And and that's all you in that audience you can cultivate in that audience you can like cater to, and then once it come the feature comes out or any other work be like hey guys because you guys have my title you guys get to have twenty percent off on this other title just because. And just to put it in perspective and be very transparent, we shot slipping into darkness for thirty five thousand. So let's say we make sixty, we just paid our. You know what I mean? And uh, as a filmmaker, upcoming filmmaker, and you know, in this city's particular, it's hard to live in. That's that stuff goes a long way, you know. And honestly, you know, sleeping into darkness is going to be a fantastic case uh, to study because they, they're hard workers. They have a community. They work really hard to cultivate that community. And, you know, some of the actors that are part of that film, some of them are, two of them were in Selena. So they have a, a, an audience of followers. They're all on board to become affiliate marketers and to promote it. So they have like, you know, I think we counted 4 million um, social media footprint. So let's say 4 million, you know, we, we got to 4 million people and we engage, we engage, and we get 1% of those, 1% of those 4 million people to buy the, the film. That's 40,000 units. Right? Just 1%. Okay, half percent. It's 20,000 units. Okay, 0.25%. That's 10,000 units. That's still great. You know? And, and, and everybody shares in the celebration and, and the stuff. And that's what we're trying to attempt here. But it's only going to work if the filmmakers put in the work. You know? And you guys already do it. Like, don't you crowdfund for your short film? Don't you get your mom and your tias and everybody and your aunties to like pay, like here's 20 bucks. Well, this is a way to go back to that community and be like, here it is. For $5.99, you can have a copy of it and everything else that you like were part of. And so like that already exists. Those mechanisms already exist. This is just a platform where you can actually activate them and make the best out of it. Great, but if you love it, go to Video Mart and sign up. I was just gonna say, sign so up. Where do we it's go? very easy. It's just like you know, Google sign up. Boom, we gotcha, and we'll never leave you alone. Just kidding. Sign up. It's free know. to sign up. Yes. It's free to sign up. No subscriptions. It's free, and um, it actually, if you share your unique link, right now we're working on some language and some and and some stuff because we're still upgrading it. Uh, where we'll be all official, official, and maybe in a week. Um, but if you even share that link and other people sign up using your link, you, again, you get 20% of their purchases until whoever, until we get to a million users or something like that, you know? Um, and that's ongoing. So it, um, we need filmmakers like you. One last thing, one last thing, just like, you know, um, Alex, is gonna have his film. We are extending the invitation to um, have Los Angeles Film School um, submit a selection of films from the alumni. Um, That's fantastic. So then you can, we can have those films up there as well. Because I, again, it's all part of having a space for people to see and to find, that is not YouTube, you know, <laughs> yeah. or Vimeo. <laughs> That's you know. really kind of you guys. Thank you. Thank you for offering that for our students. Um, so keep that in mind as you're making well, your Well, we'll co coordinate with Los Angeles Film School with the details because we're going to we're gonna need a couple of things from you. 
just, you know, if you're gonna be filmmakers, you gotta have your deliverables. Um, but other than that, and you know, we'll make that announcement in the next couple of weeks, but we are opening those doors, and, and my pleasure. Awesome, so we know to, to look into videomart.club. Club, club, club. We didn't get the calm, somebody has it, club damn is it. We'll buy them out when we get club. big. <laughs> And then where do we find you on socials? You um, plug Alex in? period Ferrufino, F-E-R-R-U-F-I-N-O. Moises, the writer, across the board. And I'm Marley.Rodriguez. Um, and please, please also, for those of you who are watching, um, subscribe to the LAFS channel. And for those here, uh, in case you can't make it, you can watch other events other panels, other talks and discussions. Um, thank you so much to the LAFS for hosting this, to our events team, for all of you for attending and those of you online, and of course, to our panelists. We'll end as we started, okay? I'm gonna give you a Ooh, Well, thank you to our <laughs> wonderful moderator. Thank yes. you, thank you. She did such a good job, it was incredible. We'll end with this, I empower other creatives by blank. Reaching down, reaching down and picking them up. Believing in them. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Those were great questions. <laughs> I was like, ah. Thanks. Is this a dating show? Where's Shonda? Where's Shonda? A mix between myself and Shonda.